Um, my name is Shoba Subramanian. I'm the Director of Curriculum and Education Initiatives here uh, at the Office of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies. Uh, how many of you here are coming for the first time to one of our career professional development events? Five or six of you. So I quickly, for those of you who have been to a number of these events, just bear with me for a minute. Uh, so I lead the career and professional development team here at the Office of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies, and our events are open to graduate students and postdocs in the biomedical sciences. We have a large population of those in the medical school, as you are aware. Uh, and if you didn't know, we have a nice website. Uh, you can grab this handout on your way out, uh, which lists all the different resources we have here, uh, including our weekly events. So we have an event every single week, uh, typically on Thursday or Friday mornings, alternating. Uh, and you'll see the list of upcoming events. And if you have an event that you want to request, feel free to email uh, myself, Shoba, or my colleague, uh, Maggie Evans. So today, uh, we have uh, Dr. Matthias Tretman and uh, Stephanie Crilly. Uh, Dr. Tretman um, will talk about his career journey and talk a little bit about how to apply for a tenure track position. But I do want to applaud uh, Dr. Tretman in that uh, he actually reached out to me, uh, I can't remember, like five or six months ago, uh, in response to uh, a survey we had sent to faculty for a different uh, uh, project that I'm working on, asking how can I help. <coughs> And to me, that was just an incredible feeling to have a faculty member uh, reaching out uh, to a team such as mine, asking what uh, uh, they can do to help. So I really, really appreciate that, and thank you so much. And then he and I had a meeting. Uh, and uh, I thought that he would be a, 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 a great person to have on our faculty corner uh, series of events. So we have faculty corner once a month. So when you see our list of events uh, in our website, you'll see uh, we have a different theme uh, each month around uh, uh, which the faculty corner is themed. So today's uh, event is themed on applying uh, for tenure track positions. So uh, Dr. Tatum will talk about that, and Steph will moderate uh, the discussion. So thank you, Steph. Steph is a third year. Fourth year? Fourth year. <laughs> Fourth year uh, grad student in uh, CMB, uh, and she's also uh, an awardee of the NSF GRFP award. Uh, and she also moved here from Carnegie Mellon to Michigan halfway into grad school. So if you guys want to kind of know about how it feels like uh, moving uh, universities because her advisor moved, uh, she moved with them. So that would be a, an interesting aside about Steph's life. So uh, Matthias also has experienced that. We were oh, talking, so okay, I cool. we'll stop moving to. <laughs> Uh, so something that you know, uh, Steph can can answer questions about later after the event. So thank you, uh, Steph and Matthias, and uh, it's all yours. Uh, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, before we get started, I just want to say thank you to Shoba and Maggie for organizing this event, and all the other organizers, um, and Matthias for being here. Um, and so, just by show of hands, before we get started, how many people are graduate students here? And how many are postdocs? <laughs> that's, that's what I think we figured was the case. Um, but yeah, we just wanted to get a sense for what the audience is. Um, and we got a lot of really great questions in the RSVPs. Um, and we're going to try to cover a lot of those topics at the beginning. Um, but if at any time anyone has a question about something they want to hear more about, please raise your hand. And at the time, at the end, we'll have time for questions as well. Um, so why don't we start by you just telling us a little bit about your academic trajectory? So where you went to grad school, how you ended up in a faculty position. Sure, my pleasure. Um, so I was born and raised in Switzerland in a small village in the middle of the Swiss Alps, surrounded by mountains and a lake, a beautiful place. However, there was pretty much nothing to do there. So I had to move on and went to a slightly bigger city in Switzerland called Basel, where I did my undergrad work in molecular biology. And uh, after finishing my undergrad terms, I felt the need to explore something new. So I joined a pharmaceutical company to pursue my master's degree. I worked on beta-lactamases, enzymes to cleave antibiotics, and tried to figure out how they can or could be stopped in order to make antibiotics potent again. So that was a great year of experience in the industry, but it also taught me that that wasn't what I was looking for at that point in my career. So I then went back to the University of Basel and pursued my grad work in microbiology with Professor Christoph de Hio. Um, after finishing my grad work, I once again felt the need to explore something new, and I signed up with a consulting company. I was working as a financial consultant, looking at asset and liability management, 
for almost two years. About a year into this new position, even though I liked all the, my things that came along with it, like the money, the time that I didn't use to have the grad student, I started to feel, not necessarily bored, but I started to miss something that kept me going and thinking about science all the time. So I one evening went back home and started to look out for positions as a postdoc. Um, it took me about half a year to start interviewing. I was looking at a couple of positions in the States, interviewing with five, six labs, and eventually found a lab I thought would be a good fit for, for me, my personality and my research interests, and I joined the lab of Hedip Blue at MIT in Whitehead back in Boston. And uh, yeah, that was in 2013. I've been at Hedip for almost five years. First at MIT, and then the lab moved to Harvard Med School. So I got exposed to both the MIT Whitehead world and the Harvard Med world, which are way different from one another. And um, being in my fifth year as a postdoc and having published a couple of papers, I started to think that I might be ready to apply for faculty positions, which I then eventually did in May 2017, I believe, is where I started. And uh, I was then active throughout the recruitment season 2017-18, was invited to a bunch of interviews, and now I'm here a faculty since July 2018. I think that's really interesting that you kind of had such a winding path to get here. I feel like we don't often hear those stories, but I think it shows that you can do so many things, and just because you pick one path doesn't mean you have to stay on that path. Um, when you went back for a postdoc, did you know that you would ultimately want to apply for faculty positions at some point? Yes, that was the only driver to do that. Uh, when I started grad school, I always had in mind that becoming a professor would be the best thing I could possibly end up achieving. And uh, while being a consultant, I started to think, what if? What if I had done a postdoc? Maybe I really would have had a chance to start my own lab. And that thought started to hunt me. And I don't like that. I don't like to think about what if, what if, what if. So I felt, you know, there's an easy way to answer that. I just have to go ahead and do a postdoc, and then I'll find out. And this is what I did. Uh, it was interesting how I eventually could convince my postdoctoral mentor to hire me. Because I was out of science or thinking about any science for two years. And that's, that's a huge gap. So he asked me, why should I hire you? What, what let's sort of, why? How can I know that you're not going to quit again very quickly? And I told him, look, I'm willing to give up a very well-paid job and join your lab on an NIH salary. If this is not enough to convince you, then I don't know what. He agreed on that. And we had, ever since, a very great relationship. <laughs> so you said, I think, at about five years in, you kind of started applying for faculty positions. Yes. Uh, so was that timeline very clear to you? I think that's one of the most common questions we got in the RSVPs was, how do you know when you're ready? Um, I mean, th there's a few factors that are known very well to everyone. You need to have published high impact work, or at least enough work that you sort of become competitive. If you haven't published in five years, there's no point to apply. If you have published after three years, you can consider applying. Uh, for me, it was sort of, uh, what triggered me to apply was first, I had a couple of first sort of papers published at that point. And secondly, I started to think that what I wanted to do no longer overlapped necessarily what my PI thought was a good thing to do. So there was a clear divergence in our interests. And uh, he would let me pursue my own ideas, but even though that was cool to still stay within his lab, I felt that right now, if all those ideas I'd like to pursue, that's enough to actually start my own business, my own lab. And this is what triggered me to actually apply. Did you get a lot of good feedback from, or did you have certain people that you sought feedback from, like obviously your postdoc advisor, but other people who kind of helped you in the process or told you maybe we think you're ready? Uh, yes, I reached out to as many people as I possibly could, and I would advise you to do this as well. You may annoy people once in a while, but that's okay. <laughs> that's really okay. So if you think you know someone who could be helpful for you, go ahead and ask them. I talked to as many junior faculty members as I could possibly find and track down at Harvard and at MIT. I asked them how did you achieve to get to where you are right now? What was your secret? Uh, 
what do I need to do in order to get to that point as well? Or where do you see my weaknesses? That's a very important thing. Most of you should be able to, I would say, give a very decent presentation, but there, there might be something in your city or in the way you speak or talk that could be seen as a certain weakness, but that can be improved. If you have someone that can point out to you what the weakness is, they can work on it. But that only works if you ask for feedback. And you need honest feedback. You don't need someone who tells you, you're great, you're fantastic. That's not helpful. <laughs> you need someone who tells you, yeah, well, OK, but you could do a lot better. And you'll find those people. Just look out for them. So I talked to junior faculties and a bunch of very senior faculties, and I got collectively a lot of very helpful feedback and input that I then tried to work or implement and use as a guidance to improve myself. I succeeded for some parts, but by no means for all of it. I think that's a really good point about feedback, and I think it's what's nice about faculty corner. Is, it may not be one-on-one, -on -one, but you get kind of some feedback about what the process is like from multiple different faculty members. Um, and so, if you're willing to share, what do you think were the strengths of your application and kind of the weaker points that you, know, you may have felt less prepared compared to your peers or? How about this? I'll share my own personal view, and then I will invite Dr. Richard Miller to maybe <laughs> ask you that, because he was chairing the committee that ended up hiring me. <laughs> <laughs> so from my point of view, I guess I had very good letters of recommendation. Um, it just is the fact that if people who are known in the field write you strong letters, that's very helpful. My postdoctoral PI has a pretty big name, and I uh, had a second letter of recommendation from a Nobel Prize winner who ended up being a co-mentor of mine. I guess that must have had some impact. Um, I feel like my research proposal was well matched or well aligned with what the institutes that ended up inviting me were looking for. And uh, I did have a number of first order publications. I had four first daughter and one less corresponding other publication when I applied. So, on that level, I was also doing, I guess, okay. I had no cell nature of science journal paper. The best paper I had was in PNIS, so there's no need for the big shot paper only. But I did have the numbers. Um, that's my point of view. I'm not sure if you still remember a bit more about that. I'm sure I remember you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, um there's a whole batch of criteria, and it depends in part on the political and intellectual situation of the hiring department, but generically, um, what I think search committees are looking for are people who clearly can take interesting ideas amongst the vast sea of potentially interesting ideas and find the two or three ideas that are actually worth spending their time and effort on and then take those well-chosen projects to a conclusion, usually a paper, but more impressively, a series of two or three papers that show progress, progression of the ideas and success. These are often very important in that critical next step, which is getting some independent grant support for the work in the faculty member's own lab. You want to get to the point where if someone who doesn't know you says, uh, who's doing really good work in X field, your name is on the top five or ten. Uh, people that are going to be on their list. You want to have a theme identified with you. Um, in addition, I always look for someone who writes well because uh, you not only need to have good quantitative skills and a good sense of science, you're going to have to write a lot of grants and a lot of papers. In giving the talk, you look for someone who's well organized and who's able to com construct talks where the documentary evidence is put within an intellectual framework that makes it sensible both to people who already know your stuff cold and to people who are going to make the actual decisions but who are encountering your own work for the first or possibly the second time. Those are generic comments. In the specific case at Michigan, uh, the challenge is always finding someone who satisfies the needs of the two or three or four people who are actually going to make the decision. So for the Biogerontology Center, we want people who are really keen on aging and we have to find a department chair, both physiology, pathology, or medicine, who sees you as fitting very nicely into their own recruiting fantasies. And uh, that's not always, that's a Venn diagram that uh, unfortunately filters out a lot of people who would be extremely strong candidates for the department or for the aging program, but only a small fraction of them 
meet both criteria and are also of sufficient quality that they are likely to get tenure in Michigan. Anyone who comes here as an assistant professor, we're going to make millions of dollars of investment in their career and don't want to lose that. So we only want to pick people who we have, think have a pretty darn good chance of being able to survive here as they choose. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so I think part of that was really the department fit. You know, do you fit what they're looking for? Does it fit what you're looking for? And so I guess in terms of your search, did you find that many of the places you applied, you were kind of tailoring you would think it was a good fit, or were there some places where you kind of stretched a little bit and it didn't end up working out? Or yeah, so when I started applying, I talked to many junior faculty, as I mentioned before, and they, Unisona told me apply to as many positions as you possibly find, even if your research proposal or your research interests don't necessarily overlap with what they're looking for. It's never bad to send in an apl application, anyways. Um, I did that to some degree. I ended up to applying to 21 positions, which is <coughs> way below average, actually. I've had a lot of friends that applied for 50, 60, 100 positions. I've been invited to four interviews, and all those four interviews were at places where they looked specifically for people with my skill and my research interests. So if I had only applied for those four, five, six positions where people looked for, in my case, neurodegeneration, aging, chapter and biology, I would have gotten the same number of invitations. So in my personal experience, going very broad just for the heck of it didn't help much, but it certainly can. Because uh, whoever is going to read your proposal, maybe once in a while you might someone find someone who reads your proposal, even though they might be looking for a Drosophila specialist, and you do Seaprafish, they think your research is a great fit, nevertheless. So they might end up inviting you. So I guess it's nothing wrong with sending out many applications, but be prepared to be rejected dozens of times. And even more so, be prepared to not hear back anything from most places. I guess I've gotten feedback from 10 places. And uh, some are very discouraging, some are just generic emails. It's very common that they don't give you feedback if you're not selected. Or you might get feedback a year afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> um, so did you, when you were searching, oh, sorry, we have a question. Sorry, I have a question on this. So a lot of the job ads are kind of generic. Do you know if it's like frowned upon or encouraged to email the a search committee to see if they are specifically looking for a type of model, skill set, research area? Again, I think it's never wrong to ask questions. Uh, it shows that you're interested, that you truly care about the position, that you want to make sure you fit as well as you possibly can. So if you send an email out, the worst that can happen is they won't reply. So you're as smart as you were before. If they do reply, you might get a slight advantage, or at least you learn something new and can then better gauge if it's worth to reply or not. So I would say yes, go for it, absolutely. I have a question. <coughs> so you can I just that just for one moment, I'm sorry, you know, because it's important, uh, I think, before you make that call, to send them an email with a CV. Because if I get a, a cold call from someone who's interested in the faculty position, I don't listen to them, and uh, the first thing I say is, please send me a CV and then we can talk about it. I'm willing to talk about it, but I don't want to do it live. I want to know who they are with it. Sorry to interrupt. Um, so you mentioned saying that most people actually apply for 3 to 60 positions, that's kind of the norm. Are these actually different positions in different universities or like multiple positions within a university, like different departments or, you know, we have idea about that? I know yeah. you didn't apply to a lot, but... Right. Usually they apply to as many universities and positions as there possibly are. I applied to two places in Michigan, applied to two places in Pittsburgh. So it's not uncommon to apply to multiple institutes within the same university, as long as they're independently run the searches. At the same time, go as broad as you possibly can isn't bad either, I'd say. So most of my friends apply to any opening they could possibly find within the states. Some would even go abroad. <laughs> that tells us, depends a lot on what you actually look for. If you want to go to Europe, well, there's no point in applying in the US. And you also actually apply to places where you think is interesting, but there's no ads actually available. Um, like a cold application, I have not found it myself. I'm not aware of anyone ever being successful using that approach. <laughs> um, that's as much as I can tell you that, really. Yeah, thanks.
Did you feel that you had some type of personal connection at most places you applied to? Like, had you maybe met some people in the departments that you were applying to that had friends who were there? Just, you know. That's a no. no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'd guess it might be helpful if you have some connections. I could totally see that, but in my case, I have no connections to any of the departments or search committees or even postdocs, junior faculties that ended up interviewing. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Networking, we often think of as a large component, but obviously, you know, it's not the only component. It's not <laughs> necessary, I guess. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like you didn't, you applied to a variety of different universities. Like our one university is small. <coughs> did you apply to small? Like, no, I did not apply to small. Okay. Um, mainly because what I was looking for was a university where I can primarily focus on the research. Most smaller, or I don't know how you would call them, R02 universities, they do a lot of research too, but the teaching focus is a lot bigger there. Um, at universities such as here in Michigan, I can devote most of my time to run a lab, to do research, and I still need to do some teaching, but it's very limited. Whereas at a more teaching-oriented university, you have to spend half of your time, or even more, investing in teaching actively or preparing for it. That means your research time is cut short. At the same time, it's also less likely that you get a lot of grad students, if at all, or postdocs. So your research is essentially run and driven by undergrads. They can do a fantastic job, absolutely. But an undergrad doesn't compare to a postdoc. It's just a fact. Can I just say one word about the networking business? It works in both ways. So when we have a position open, we start by sending letters to 30 or 40 senior scientists and 30 or 40 a senior scientists saying, do you know anybody that we want to talk to? And to uh, promising assistant professors, often not tenured, saying, would you like to move to Michigan? <laughs> and, uh, and then from the other end, if I'm a postdoc looking for a job, he or she will often bring me 20 names of labs they want to think about for applying for jobs. And I will say, this place, this place, this place, top of the list, I'll make a call. These places, you know. Um, so in terms of your funding going into application process, did you have any postdoctoral grants? Ah, uh, yes, I did. I was in the lucky position to have my postdoc fully funded from the first day on until the very last day. So I was on uh, three different fellowships. I still have funding right now, so I had a transitional award at the very end. And I'm not sure how much that really factored in, but if I compare myself or look at my junior faculty friends now here at Michigan and also elsewhere, I guess nine out of ten had some money to bring along when they started. It doesn't necessarily need to be another one, uh, sorry, a K99 or 00. Anything helps, even if it's just to show that you can write competitive proposals and attract funding. In my case, my grant that I'm still on right now is fairly small, but it was uh, still, it helps me. It gives me some credibility that I wouldn't have if I had no funding. So, grad students, postdocs alike, try to apply. You will fail a number of times, but once <coughs> you succeed, it's going to help you a lot. Um, so you're also, you are an international, or you were international as a postdoc. Um, do you think that influenced kind of your trajectory here, or your ability to find positions, or was it a factor? Did you think about moving back to Europe? Oh. Yeah, it's, it's a big factor, especially if you have um, significant daughters or a family or kids attached. So then it, it's a completely different game because you not, not only have to satisfy your own wishes, you have to look out for your family or for your partner. Um, in my case, what I had to consider were visa considerations. Uh, as internationals may well be aware, there is the J visa line that is a good one to be on. If you're having a J1, your partner can be in a J2 that allows the partner to work as well. Um, I've been on a J, now I'm on an H visa. H visas are still okay, but my partner can no longer work now being on an H2, which is a problematic situation. It can be a game killer at times, depending on how things are. The next thing is, um, since I'm not a permanent resident, I have no, actually not access to all funding schemes that are available within the US because very often they require you to have at least a green card or be a citizen. 
Um, what else is there to say? I mean, language, it's a very obvious thing. I'd say I'm okay now, I can sort of speak English, but <laughs> you just gotta face it. If you're not speaking well enough that people can understand you, you can have five major papers, but no one is gonna hire you because, well, that's, it's, it's, it's just a basic need to have you, set, that you have to satisfy. Um, then also being away from family, parents, friends, the, it comes at a certain price, and uh, after a couple of years, you it can affect you. It's, I'm okay with that, but I've had a lot of friends that will go back home eventually because they miss family too much, or because they wanted to have their grandkids growing up next to their grandmas and granddads. Um, other than that, I'd say I'd never ever faced any discrimination because I was not American. I've had the same opportunities to apply. I felt I've been treated everywhere just as if I had an American passport. So from that point of view, I'd say it doesn't make a difference at all. Um, I also wanted to come back to, I think one of the other things that makes you very unique is that you had a lot of experience in industry and outside of academia. And do you think that that kind of taught you any lessons in the process or helped you learn things that you felt were an advantage to? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> So my one year in, in the pharmaceutical industry taught me how they do run science. It's a different kind of science they pursue because the end goal is not to learn necessarily more important knowledge. The end goal is to come up with something that can provide the benefit in terms of a reward, like a financial reward. They want to produce a product that they can actually sell. Of course, they say we want to treat a disease, but eventually they want to make assets because they have usually there are stakeholders in the back and they have interests. It's just how it is. So the type of science they do, what they do in the lab is similar to what we guys do in the academic lab, but the way how projects are assigned or how it is decided which projects to push is very often a purely strategic decision, not so much. It doesn't mean that the best project is going to continue because it's the most promising. They will select projects based on their market potential. Um, my consulting stint helped me a lot to learn the game of numbers. And uh, that is a very important aspect of running a, a lab. Because now I've been given a pot of money and I've been told, here, use it, good luck. <laughs> so, no one tells me, this is your budget, this is how you should assign your, your money to individual tasks and parts. That's all in my hands. Now, after two years working with numbers all the time, I feel like I sort of know how to come up with a budget, how to sort of do some simple accounting to make sure that I'm not running over budget very quickly. And another thing I also learned as a consultant is how to transmit ideas and convince lay audiences about the importance of what I do. As a financial consultant, I often had to talk to lay audiences and explain them why their pension fund should invest 50 million into a certain product. And those lay audiences were made out of people from, from I don't know, administrative offices, sometimes the garbage man was there, sometimes the CEO was there, so a very, very wide variety of, of uh, backgrounds. If you convince such a lay audience, regardless of what they know about the importance of the point you want to make, that's a skill that is transferable to science too. And I guess one last question before we open it up to the audience. Is there any kind of critical piece of advice that you would have or maybe advice that you received when you were applying? It sounds like you're really advising people to just, you know, ask. It never hurts to ask. But if there's anything else that you learned from the process or wish you knew? Uh, practice. <laughs> uh, that especially holds up for when you're invited to an interview. The one seminar you're asked to give, that should be the best one you've ever set up. Don't shy any any time in making sure that's the best looking presentation you've ever given. I've been, for example, reformatting figures from my own papers to make sure that the fonts match the fonts that I use in my PowerPoint. That took me like 10 hours. And you could say that was useless. I'm not sure if it did help me, but it certainly made sure it all looked co like coherently nice. And that's the one presentation you really need to nail. 
you should know that thing by heart. You should know the sequence of the slides by heart. You should know the first five minutes by heart. That you should just practice, practice, practice until you really can nail that thing. Because you never know what might happen if you're supposed to give the talk. In my case, when I was here in Michigan, um, I brought my own laptop, a new MacBook. That thing didn't fit well with the beamer they had. So I was standing there for about 10 minutes waiting for someone to come up with an adapter and finding a way to finally load a presentation. That doesn't help you. That doesn't help your concentration much. So if you're still a bit shaky with your presentation, that can already be it. But I knew I could just close my eyes and start even without the slides being there because I've practiced it so much that, was, that was, it was really mine. And that helped. And the same also for talk talk, even more so. Mm -hmm. I would advise you to practice this as much as you can and especially invite people that are not familiar with your research to join. Because if you practice with your lab mates, they all sort of know what you want to tell them. But eventually at Chalk Talk, the audience you're going to face, in, most of them have no clue about your research. So you need to convince those guys that what you do is important and cool enough for them to hire you. And one thing I wish I would have been told before I gave my first job talk was that the time you're usually given to prepare for your job talk can and should be used to set up the stage for your job talk. So you're given a whiteboard. You can use a couple of colors and draw out schemes. You can draw out a couple of plots but not <coughs> label what it is. You can draw, I don't know, if you work with worms, you can draw out a worm and label a few parts as teasers. And it also gives you sort of a frame to follow afterwards during your talk. It makes it so much easier. Um, yeah, so if anyone has questions, maybe more questions specifically about the interview process for applying. Yeah, I'm wondering, could you just walk us through sort of how you prepare your application materials? I think that's something that does get addressed a lot. How do you start writing cover letters, start writing, you know, your, your kind of perspective parts of the, the, the application? Um, I started with reading about five proposals from friends of mine that were successful. Then I read about three proposals from friends of mine that are not successful. <laughs> So I wanted to get a feeling for what has worked in the past and what didn't so much. And uh, so I then started to design my own proposal accordingly. There is a certain type of structure that is inherited between all most proposals. And then I was very happy when I had my first five-page proposal ready, so I started to work on cover letters. And then I, I finally actually had a closer look at the job ads and then saw that very often the teaching statement was required. <coughs> So in my case, I already had one because I did teach at MIT and I had to write one for MIT, so that was already set. Uh, especially the UCs require you to write a diversity statement as well. Um, that's also something you have to take very seriously. Uh, I've gotten a couple from grad students in our lab as a template and then sort of tried to write my own based on, on what I've seen or what I've been doing. and. Um, yeah, then I had my five-page application and I started to look at the job ads and I realized that a couple asked for a two-pager, I one asked for a one-pager. So I had to essentially adapt it to have to one, two, three, four, or five-page proposal. And this is at times challenging. The five-page is easy. The one-page is super tough. So be ready and invest enough time to get that done. Um, in my case, I actually used a proposal that I successfully had used with a foundation before as template and then build on this. And uh, yeah, that worked out eventually. But it, it took me about three months, I'd say, to set up all those things. Three months every evening from 8 till midnight. May I add a word about the cover letter in particular? Because that's absolutely critical. Um, most people will make up a tentative decision which correlates very strongly with the first decision within about 10 or 20 seconds. And they spend that 10 or 20 seconds reading the first half page of the cover letter. So the successful applications almost always in the cover letter present the three key reasons you want me. And those three key reasons are, this is what I work on, I've had great success, and I'm 
uh, have a great plan, which you're going to read about in the research proposal, to solve this problem or to at least make major strides in this problem. If I get to the bottom of the first page of the cover letter, the, first, the cover letter is a page and a half to two, you don't want to bore people. If I get to the bottom of the first page and I'm not already thinking, hey, I want to read this research proposal, the game is pretty much over. So the research proposal has to be really good and absolutely right, varying lengths is absolutely critical. But the cover letter is the, your en entry, and unfortunately, too often it's the sort of the last thing that they attention to. When did you start looking at the applications? So my fear is that I will look at it and realize that I have a gaping hole in my resume that other people have, that all the successful people have. So how early should I start looking at it and realizing, oh, I need to mentor more people or do this or that to be competitive with these successful applicants? Well, I guess the earlier you think about it, the better for you, because it gives you more time to address it. Yeah. Um, so if you're a grad student, you should be very cautious about which lab you're going to join as a postdoc. Mm -hmm. I personally looked at the, the career trajectory of postdocs from the labs I applied for as well. So the, the lab I actually joined, I knew that two-thirds of all postdocs ended up in faculty positions, sometimes even with, with just a single publication. So I felt something <coughs> was done right in this lab to prep people for faculty work. Um, I cannot tell you if joining a big lab is key, joining a small lab is key, uh, that's very individual, but um, identifying holes very early will help you. So I guess the perfect candidate has a bunch of high impact applications, has successfully attracted funding, very often so, has published well not only as a postdoc but also as a grad student to show some continuity of productivity, um, then incorporate all the good points Dr. Miller mentioned previously, like show the development of a project. Um, you should have mentored people, as, as many as possible, and successfully so. So if you have a publication where your undergrad is on as well, that gives you some extra credit. Even more so if you might have taught some, some real classes, I don't know, like journal clubs, uh, something students get credit for. Um, funding is a key thing, yeah. Attract funding whenever you can. Hey, those people that are super hard to come by, they do exist. <laughs> They're very hard to come by. So the, the key, I guess, is yeah, identify your weaknesses and find a way to make people focus on your strengths and forget about the weaknesses. So in your postdoc time, I mean, like, I see that two key things which all postdocs do is write papers and then write grants. Which one do you concentrate more on? Is that an answer to it? Because as a grad student, I'm assuming that, I mean, once you graduate, your responsibility is that you, to some degree, you've learned how to write papers. So do you concentrate more on getting grants during your postdoc fees, or? Well, it's very hard to attract money if you haven't published, or at least have results. Just writing a, a grant on an idea, they're very hard to get funded. So ideally, you have like a first paper that's submitted or close, and then you write a grant about that stuff and show what you want to do next. This, the package of results you have will give you, give you some credibility. It will show that you can work on this topic, that you successfully did so. But uh, there is no golden rule to it. I mean, eventually, I guess it's easier to find a faculty position without being funded as a postdoc, but having published well than the other way around. If you have a K99 or a O award, but you don't manage to publish, no one is going to hire you. Um, I'm presuming there's some sort of like new faculty handbook that you get when you get hired, and it's probably <laughs> <laughs> about you know getting your lab up and running. Is there anything that you kind of had to discover on your own, you know, that no one really told you or it wasn't in the handbook? Like just a good like pro tip for like just the logistics of getting your lab started and that yeah. sort of thing. So I guess I have to blame here myself, but I'm the type of person, when I buy a new computer or a new machine, I don't necessarily read the instructions. <laughs> so it holds up a bit for becoming a junior faculty as well. I did get some like official information package of things, and there were a couple of very helpful introductory events, and especially here in Michigan, there is a whole office that focuses on faculty development, so they can essentially help you with everything you would like to do. 
But still, there is a couple of things that people wouldn't necessarily think about. Like in my case, for example, it took me three months to figure out that there is this uh, bioconsumable shop run by the U where I can get growth media for very cheap money downstairs in PSRB. <laughs> I was going ahead and I bought like 100 liters of DMEM from a vendor because I felt that's a great deal and I have still a fridge full of it. I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> Like I missed out on a couple of those tiny things, but I guess that's uh, predominantly my fault because I didn't ask him. Mm -hmm. I could have found someone in a neighboring lab where you get your stuff from, where's the best place to get it from, which you have taken into account. And I didn't. I asked a lot of questions, but I didn't ask all of them. Yeah, who were the people that you think you relied on most kind of when getting your lab started? Like, did you kind of have mentors that you identified or were matched with you in some way to help? So here in Michigan, junior faculty are provided with an official mentoring or steering committee. In my case, it's, it's three senior faculty members from physiology. I'm also in a very fortunate position that the gerontology center I'm part of is a very collegial, so whenever I have a question, I can just go to anyone I think would be appropriate to give me an answer for, and they will help me. I've not once yet seen someone telling me no, or I don't have time. And that makes it very easy. It makes it a lot easier. And I'd say that holds up for most places I've seen so far. In general, if they hire you, as Dr. Miller mentioned previously, they invest a lot of money in you, so they want you to succeed, and they're willing to give you the help you need in order to get there. Do you have any tips so when you have uh, individual meetings with the senior faculty during the interview, should you learn about their research in advance? Because uh, so not everyone will do very similar research with you, so yeah. how should you handle that? So when I prepared for interviewing, I would look up to the web pages of all people I was about to talk to, and I would try to at least cross-read one or two abstracts of their most recent publications, but just to get a feeling for what they actually look at. You don't want to ask a Drosophila person about the newest trends in mouse biology. <laughs> but um, that, that being said, I've not once talked with anyone about their research. What I've been most often, they would ask me questions. They wanted me to explain again what I was actually trying to explain to them at my seminar. <laughs> Very often, you'll talk to people that didn't make it to your seminar, so you essentially give your seminar to them. Uh, I've had these one-on-ones where I didn't say a word for an hour. I was just bombarded with someone else giving me a presentation, which is <laughs> kind of relaxing. It's a different thing. <laughs> um, I had situations where someone told to me about for one hour about their health and how they, they would prefer to be in better shape. So yet again, something very different. So it's certainly good if you know as much as you can about the person you're going to talk to, but it's very unlikely that they're going to Q&A you on their own research. I don't want to say it's never going to happen, but not so. Well, the, an exception, I think you're right in general, but the exception to that rule is if uh, your work and the work of the person you're talking to are uh, overlapping substantially. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Often they'll want to talk to you in part to try to impress you with what a great collaborative opportunity uh, is going to come your way if you should happen to come to Michigan. Sure. So if you're a C. elegans biologist, for instance, there'll be a number of C. elegans labs here who want to present the work to you in some detail so that you can start to focus on resources that are available and people to talk to. Absolutely. Yeah. Did you find those conversations to be conversations or interviews? <laughs> and did that depend on the university culture? That depends. Or was it just individual? That was very individual. In some cases, it was really just a conversation amongst certain equals, sort of. In other cases, it was clearly being interviewed and interrogated. Like, why do you think you would be a good fit for our department? Give me three reasons. So, well, I had to come out of three reasons, so you're going to be ready for everything. But I guess the uh, key is never become defensive, never mm -hmm. feel like or show that you feel like you're being offended. Never offend anyone, even if it's related to research, um, then there's really not much you can do wrong, I guess. 
people that don't pretend to be someone who you're not. Because uh, they're going to hire you based on the interactions you have. And if you pretend to be someone you're not, sometimes they hire you, that's not going to work out well. Um, I'm guessing for your interviews, you had a second look or like a second invited interview. Um, what were the things that you looked for, I guess, when you're weighing your options about whether the university would be a good fit? Okay, in my case, I have two kids. I have a, a wife, and uh, I wanted to find something where I'd be sort of relaxed enough to go to work, knowing that my family is happy too. So this is why I have not applied to any universities at the coasts, because very honestly, you cannot. It's very hard to support a family on an assistant professor's salary if you live in San Francisco, New York, or Boston. That's just almost a no-go. So because of that, I did not apply there. I excluded those places and then focused on places where I thought the life-work balance or quality it would be higher based on being the single income person. And uh, with that in mind, then I chose the places I first applied for. Then for a second place, when I started to think about where I might actually want to join or go back to, I was very much looking for a collaborative environment because I always enjoy enjoyed collaborative work as a postdoc. I think more hands and brains usually come up with something better than a single person does. And um, Michigan struck me with their approach to collaborative science. They have not only talked about that being the case, but I always got the feeling that they really live up to this. It's not just a, a promise, they really do so. And I felt very welcome, and that was a very easy decision for me to make. I have the question. And uh, when you receive uh, the offer from the university, that moment that the university say yes, and usually it's coming with uh, that offer with the salary or package to start the lab. Do you think that we are in any position to negotiate that package or of just course. say yes to everything? No, no, no. <laughs> Don't. That's the one time in your life where you have more power than you think you have. That's the one time where you can come up with your demands. They may not necessarily be grand at all, but this is the time where you have to tell them, I need so and so much money because otherwise I cannot do the research. The moment they give you an offer, they sort of, they're willing to, to get you in, and that will come at a certain cost. And if the initial offer isn't enough to cover what you think needs to be covered, then you have to negotiate. I mean, it doesn't make sense if the initial offer is half a million and you ask for five million, that's not going to work out. So you have to stay within a reasonable frame. But if you come up with a budget, like I like laid out the costs of the lab that I would like to run in the first three to five years, this is the salary cost for grad students, for postdocs, this is the piece of equipment I think I will need, this is the buffer I would like to have, and that's the amount of money I think would therefore be reasonable. You, taking that approach, you can usually come up with a budget that looks more or less reasonable, and this is a good starting point for discussions. If what they've offered is way below, they're likely to increase it, if they can and that. If it's way above, then there is no point for it to ask for more. But yeah, you should negotiate, but just uh, stay realistic. Mm -hmm. So I would like to ask to the professor there. <laughs> so the university is always open to increase the, the, the baggage for the start the lab? No. <laughs> and the local circumstances that are pertinent in each case, there are some departments that have a lot of money and others that don't. There are some departments which um, have funds that uh, could potentially be augmented, but it's really hard to do so. Uh, and we've lost place people who we thought were really good to inferior universities who had a lot more money. So uh, in general, if we have identified someone we want to bring on board, we do what we can to meet their needs, but uh, simply adding dollars to a package is is seldom possible beyond a small with a small amount of wiggle room. We don't view this as an industrial negotiation where we start with a low ball offer, knowing that we're going to have to come up and make an offer we think will be attractive, and I'm willing to adjust if necessary within financial constraints uh, if there are very specific needs that have to be met. Often the university gets involved in other ways. If 
clearly if one has to find a job, academic or otherwise, for a significant other, we can often help with that. Uh, and the university is eager to recruit your faculty members with high quality, but lots of extra money that we would have put in the offer up if, if we really had to, that's usually not the case. At least not in my department. I do want to mention that the University of Michigan and some other universities have a dual career office. Oftentimes, they partner the significant other with the uh, Office of Dual Career Services, who will uh, allow the uh, spouse or the partner to explore opportunities that align with their uh, their career interests. Twenty-five years ago, that was very uncommon, and now it's very common, and it's a major mm -hmm. step forward uh, because the university here and elsewhere noticed they were losing a lot of terrific candidates because of the necessity for you know the two couple a two person uh, hire had to had to be done now that the university has finally figured that out they're doing a fairly good job in many cases to facilitate hiring uh, two people who are both qualified and look really good but uh, it has to be put together at the same time for two people that, that's hard to do I had a question for Chalk Talks and how you balance like defending your ideas without coming across as defensive but also taking the new ideas that they might provide you in stride. But like it seems like an interesting balance to not, not treat it like a prelims, right? <laughs> where they where they're like kind of grilling you on your scientific ideas and being open to those but also defending the things that you came up with. How do you balance that? That's a, that's a tough one, Hillary. <laughs> um, I guess my advice would be go to as many job talks as you possibly can and learn from how people do it and from those that do it well. And usually it's a good thing if someone gives you some input to acknowledge the importance or let the impact this impact can have by saying thank you for the suggestion. I will certainly consider that. It's not a good idea to tell them no. <laughs> But if you show that you're open for input, that also, I guess, gives you some credibility, or people then think that they might be able to work with you and also help you to become successful. Because no one expects you to be successful all by yourself, as a true faculty. And you will need to come to get input and also make use of it. So if you do so at a chalk talk, I guess, that can be a sign for you being willing to be mentored, which is usually seen as a good thing. Mm -hmm. Some, uh, you have to sort of read into the soul of the person asking the question. There are some people uh, who are trying to test you, yeah. and that's unpleasant, and I think unkind. And, and you need to recognize that and pass the test if you can. Often, though, more often, the person is interested in asking a question, uh, is this the kind of individual with whom scientific conversations are pleasant and productive? Mm -hmm. Uh, that's what you're really looking for in a new colleague. And that even if they're not quite on the same line of thought, they think some of your work could be improved, that they want to kind of, if you really is engage you in a discussion, and if, if you're someone like that, the issue will prove immediately, yeah, this is a person you can have a productive conversation with. That's, a, that's always a winner. Mm -hmm. And one thing I want to say, you've got to be ready for nasty questions or questions that are meant to bring you out of your concept. Mm -hmm. To give you an example, I've once been asked an interview, so I was asked first, a very common question is, a question, who is your major competitor? Or who would you think you're going to compete with? That's a very common question in uh, job talks. I've been asked that at all my job talks, as far as I recall. So I told them there is that one lab that does very similar research, uh, published very well on postdoc, he's currently hitting the job market too. So then one senior faculty men, uh, member told me, oh yeah, we know, because we've invited that guy from next week. So why did we should hire you rather than him? So that was a tough one. <laughs> so I gave them an answer, told them, well, I can just talk for myself. I'm sure he's going to do great as well. He's going to do great science. He did so in the past. Um, his focus might be slightly different from what I do, but it's going to be up to you. I think what I do is fits well with what the department looks for. So I gave a sort of an answer, and then I was halfway into my answer, and this person told me, I'm just joking, he's not coming. <laughs> <laughs> but there are people that will try to just get you off. <laughs> so you're ready. It wasn't Dr. <laughs> Any last questions?
Yes. So, in terms of making the decision to actually move to Michigan or anywhere that you're actually designing, does it actually help to talk to the junior faculty in that department? Absolutely. Okay. So, so once I looked at second interviews, I talked very much with junior faculty members of the program. I did almost on a daily basis. And everyone I talked to was very supportive. They told me about their process, hiring process, how they did negotiations, what I could expect, what I couldn't expect, what I should look out for. I guess once that step is reached, everyone is trying to help you to be successful, and that means starting out with enough money for your research, uh, getting everything you sort of need to do your research. And that will also maybe tell you, you no, know, if you talk to this guy, you may want to be a bit more cautious, and if you talk to this guy, you should be a bit more open. This is the kind of information you're usually receiving before you go to a second interview, because then very often they want you to feel like you're part of the team. I guess we'll wrap it up then. Thanks, everyone. I think we had really great questions. Um, thank you, Matthias. Thank you so much. Thank really you, Dr. Miller. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>